Welcome back to Think Tech. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Hawaii, the state of clean energy. And our discussion today is, uh, is there a chance for nuclear energy in Hawaii uh, with our special guest, Representative Corey Chun. Uh, and we are really looking forward to talking with him about the bill he introduced and the, the other bill, there are two bills, uh, which would create a, an environment for nuclear energy here in Hawaii. Uh, welcome to the show, Corey. Yeah, thanks for having me, Jay. So it's, it's great. Uh, tell me about your uh, background, your 35th district, S.Y. Pahu, uh, and you've been around. You have you know, been in various government organizations over the past few years, uh, and you have been associated with various committees in the legislature and various nonprofits outside the legislature. So give us a couple of hundred words on who you are, Corey. <laughs> sure. So I'm, I'm uh, new to the House of Representatives. Uh, I was recently elected in 2022. So this is going into my second session. Uh, prior to that, I was with the Honolulu City Council as a staff member for Council Chair Tommy Waters, where I was primarily working on um, budget issues and some land use and uh, noise, actually, because you know, <laughs> when it comes down to an urbanized Honolulu, noise is a, is a big issue. Uh -huh. uh, and then prior to that, I was, uh, with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network, uh, doing cancer advocacy on behalf of cancer patients and their families. And uh, the other thing is I, I also served on the Waipawa Neighborhood Board for 15 years until I got elected uh, and also had the chance to serve as vice chair and chair of the board. Uh, so I represent District 35, which is Waipahu and um, Pearl City. So I have a, a little bit of Waipahu and a little bit of Pearl City. And that's the <laughs> district that was created. Fifteen years on the neighborhood board. Wow, that is that must be some kind of record. <laughs> yeah, and uh, you know, um, this is very interesting that you have introduced a lot of bills. You've been prolific this session, um, and I'm just to your credit. And also among them, this uh, nuclear energy bill. Uh, can you tell us how that came to you? How that came to your desk, um, and uh, what what your thinking was to introduce it? Sure. So, you know, I, I have a, a background in, in public health primarily. That's where I spent most of my, my career, uh, ten, almost 10 years with the American Cancer Society. But during the interim, so after the 2023 legislative session, there's a lot of organizations like the National Council on State Legislatures that have trainings for new legislators to just get them uh, experience and understanding of all the topics that we have to cover because, you know, my first year, you know, while I kind of understand public health really well, you know, I'm, I'm a member, vice chair of the Corrections Military Veterans. I didn't have a lot of experience with the criminal justice system. So trying to get up to speed on that. Uh, water and land, I, I, I'm on that committee. I'm just getting up to the state land use and all the issues with, um, you know, agriculture and water use. Uh, so what I was able to do during the interim was to go on this um, to this conference called the uh, Legislative Energy Horizons Institute, which is put on by NCSL and also the University of Idaho. And what that program is, is basically a program to allow legislators from across the country a chance to take a deep dive into understanding how energy delivery is done in the United States and also in Canada. So knowing very little about energy, other than you know you turn the lights on and turn it off. Yeah, but you're you're a very curious fellow. We can tell by the, all the things you're associated with, um, and that means you have to be a lawyer because lawyers, among other oh, things, are yeah. curious people, right? True. Yes. Yes. I do. I do have a law degree. I haven't technically practiced for about fifteen years, so I, I tell people I'm, I'm retired, but yeah, I do have a, a legal background. <laughs> So okay, anyway, so continue, yeah. Yeah. So anyway, during this this conference, uh, you know, I, I got a chance to learn about all the other states and, and how they produce their energy. And especially in the Pacific Northwest, you know, they have hydroelectric, which is one of the cleanest forms of energy. Uh, but, you know, even those types of energy sources, there's always the good and bad with it, right? So that was one of the other things too that they're trying to share is just that whatever energy source you pick, 
uh, no matter the benefits, there are some drawbacks. Um, so, you know, just taking a look at how things are done across the country, uh, two things stuck out in my mind that I learned. And the first thing is that, unlike the continental US, if we need energy for whatever reason, we can't tap into another state's grid or ask them to send over energy, which they do in a lot of other states, right? They're connected with the East Coast and the West Coast grid. Even Canada can send power down. Uh, and the other thing too is that our state is not on the same grid. So um, unfortunately, even between Oahu and the Big Island, we cannot send energy back and forth, which means that every island has to produce their own energy, which is another uh, issue that we face, right? Because even if you have a lot of uh, geothermal possibilities on the Big Island, it can never generate energy that could be used for Oahu where the greatest need is. So trying to find solutions to this problem uh, was something that I was really interested in. And one of the things that I learned at this conference was about nuclear energy. And to be honest, what I tell people is that before I went to this conference, my understanding of nuclear energy came from The Simpsons, where you, you, know, you see this giant reactor with green goo coming out and it's like, that's the worst thing ever. Like, why would you even consider <laughs> nuclear energy? It's just so terrible, right? And then you think about all of the uh, tragedies that, that have happened throughout the years, and it's just like, you know, why would you even think about nuclear energy at this time? But what, uh, what was presented was the advancements in technology. So specifically what I was interested in was of small modular reactors and micro reactors. And what some folks have pointed out to me when I when I came back to uh, to Hawaii was that we actually do have micro reactors in our state. They are actually in Pearl Harbor in our nuclear powered subs that have been powered for the, maybe the last twenty years. So it, it's not it wouldn't be like a new technology, uh, but just something that would be applied, you know, outside of the military and to actual commercial uses. Mm -hmm. So um, you know, if, I, if you keep going, I mean, I, I could keep going, but what, so what happened is I came back, uh, I was looking at what was done uh, on nuclear energy before. And so the bill I introduced is to create a nuclear energy commission. It's not something new. So Representative Sean Quinlan, he was the first call I made because he introduced the exact same bill in 2019 and said, hey, Sean, you know, are you, are you still interested in this? You know, you're gonna introduce it again. And he, he's, he said, no, you, you should do it, <laughs> go, go ahead. And he actually reminded me that uh, former representative Mark Takai and even um, Senator Sam Sloan and Fred Hemings actually introduced the bill as well. So it's, it, it was a bipartisan kind of idea. It wasn't just a, you know, a Democratic or Republican idea. So yeah. there's, there's some history to it. Um, I started with that bill because really what it is is just to start the conversation. It wasn't to say if if your energy for Hawaii would be good or bad. It's just, you know, is it a viable option? So that's that's really what the point of it was. Huh. Hmm. Okay. I thought there were two bills. Um yeah, so, what, what, so what's the other a, one? There is another bill. So so the other thing about nuclear energy is we do have a constitutional amendment in our constitution that's you know prohibits the construction of any uh, nuclear power plant or disposal of any waste in the state unless it gets approval by two thirds of both houses in the, in the legislature. So the other bill would repeal that uh, threshold so that mm. you, know, you wouldn't need that approval. And, and that's, that would be a constitutional amendment. To yeah, so that would, you'd have to cha change the constitution to, to do that. Yeah. Well, I, I wanted to tell you a story, Corey. I'll tell you what my story is. This is like five or six years ago. Fred Hemings, Republican, but, you know, he was a non-denominational kind of Republican. Um, he called me, and he asked me to come down to his office in the ledge, and I did. And uh, he said he wanted to share something really important with me. Okay. And um, he was really excited about the possibility of this modular nuclear energy. And he said he'd, he'd talked with Dan Inouye. Uh, I wish I could call Dan Inouye right now and ask him about this. 
<laughs> he said Dan and Hoy had suggested it to him, and it was it was in favor of this modular nuclear, you know, energy. And um, he described it to me, and he had materials on it. And what it was was a a, a device about the size of a Volkswagen bus, um, big van, okay, which is not that big. And uh, the idea is you would find a small city or town. Uh, somewhere a remote place. They were thinking of Alaska. Um, maybe this came from Stevens, you know, uh, Senator Stevens, uh, Dan Noway's friend. And um, and and you dig a hole thirty feet deep, roughly, and you put the, the the van in there, and it was a nuclear reactor, modular nuclear reactor. You cover it up, uh, and it would generate, uh, a, you know, uh, on, on one supply of uranium, it would generate power for this community of maybe a few thousand people uh, for 30 years. Um, and then when all of that was over, you'd either cover it over or dig it up and put another one in there. And it was actually very cheap and very safe. And uh, my recollection is that the company that was designing this was Toshiba in Japan. And so Fred was trying to, you know, get some traction on that. I don't think he ever did, honestly. Um, but I thought that was pretty interesting that you could do this without the risk, as you say, of Fukushima or anything like that. Um, and you could put it underground and cover it up, make it safe. And it would be the best application of nuclear energy for electricity that you could possibly think of. And, um, you know, it, it's, it's not a, a NIMBY kind of thing because you could really bury it away uh, from, you know, populated areas. H has you ever heard of that? Is that what you're talking about? Yes. So that's that's sort of what my interest was, not not in the full-blown, you know, reactors, but these smaller reactors that maybe not strong enough to power the entire grid, but at least to power enough to, you know, move us away from some of the other uh, fossil fuels and other things. Because um, that's the other thing I... I learned is that you know there there's we, we always talk about net zero and net I guess depending on which state every state has a different definition of net zero um, so what I've I've learned is that some states their idea of net zero is they'll still be producing burning coal or all these other fossil fuels but they'll use other technologies to offset it so so this one there's one participant who is a longtime senator from Oregon said, you know, we really should be going to zero, not just net zero. And, you know, that really stuck with me because I'm like, yeah, that's true. You know, we shouldn't be just trying to offset it to be neutral. We should be going to zero. And nuclear at the time or at this time, I think is the only source that is carbon free. Uh, so that's that was one of the other, you know, big advantages of nuclear energy. Yeah, people have a, um, a bias against it, you know, because of, you know, the bomb and World War II and, um, and because of Fukushima. But in fact, the technology has gone much further than that. And it's really all about technology. You know, I, I, I commend you on your curiosity. I commend you on choosing to go to this conference, even though this is not necessarily mainstream for you in the ledge. Um, but it is an, it's an expression of your your curiosity and your willingness to engage in new technology that would help Hawaii, new policy that would help Hawaii. That's great. You probably aspire to get on the energy committee, right? <laughs> well, <laughs> I don't consider myself an energy expert, but at least I think just having a better understanding of, of how energy works, uh, I, I think would just make me a better legislator because at least when these questions or issues come up, uh, my hope is that I will be able to ask the right questions because I think part of our job is all about asking the right questions um, to have those discussions. And prior to this, like I mentioned before, yeah, I, I did not have a lot of, of background knowledge about energy. But, you know, just even learning things about uh, the difference between what a base load of energy is versus, uh, you know, the intermittent, right? So we, we're going with a lot of wind and solar but those things are intermittent and, you know, depending on how the wind is blowing or the weather or even with solar, right? If it's cloudy one day, uh, PICO has to manage all of that. 
And so when the output is low because of weather or climate, uh, you know, you're going to have to go to your base load energy. And so right now, you know, we're, we're still burning oil. We're trying to move to more renewables, but trying to find that consistent and reliable base load energy is, is really key, I think. You know, it's interesting. This is part of a conversation that took place uh, in the first few years of, of, the, of the aught years between, uh, say, 2005, 2010, about um, portfolios, portfolios of various renewables. And, uh, of course, solar was in that portfolio. Wind, uh, the first wind on Maui was a big deal. Um, and then we always talked about geothermal. Uh, Big Island, and we talked, and we talked about uh, the cable. You referred to the cable, but the cable died a political death, um, and it's now it's, it's. May I use the term radioactive? <laughs> and so you know, we talked about um, you know biofuel, and uh, we talked about uh, oh, ocean ocean wind, you know, and ocean thermal energy. Um, and wave energy. I mean, it was so many things. I remember going to conferences such as the one you're talking about, where they had people displaying, you know, a dozen different kinds of alternative energies. And there were there was a Renewable Energy Society of Hawaii and and they Association of Hawaii, and it was um, you know made up of people who were interested in exploring all these energies. But somewhere along the way, it all became solar. With, with lesser wind, because wind has a NIMBY problem. You know, as soon as you build a wind farm, the people come around and say, no, not in my backyard. Um, so solar has been more and more, you know, the exclusive method of renewable energy, which has its, um, you know, it has its, its, its downsides. Do you remember uh, in Puerto Rico, uh, in the storm, uh, what was it, Maria in Puerto Rico, um, and how how it uh, they had lots of solar big solar farms, and the wind just tore it all up. Now they had no electricity. Uh, of course, it also tore up the infrastructure. So I think you know going modular, adding to um, you know the solar you know, community solar facilities is actually a real option. This this is not just a fantasy. <laughs> This is real action. <laughs> and I, I wonder how much you've been able to, you know, convince your, your peers in the legislature about the, the viability of a project like this and what kind of response you've get you've gotten from them and from the public, your constituents. What do you what what's your experience been, Corey? It's been it's been mixed. Um I, I was quite surprised at the the amount of support that people have reached out to about. Just, you know, either they've lived in a state that had uh, a nuclear reactor or, you know, they're from the military and understand either they've worked on a, a nu nuclear sub or understand the, the mechanics and the technology. Um, but, you know, I also had people who they think I'm crazy because they, they realize or they, they think to what my perception of before learning about, uh, you know, small modular reactors and micro reactors was you know, the Simpsons, right? It's like you want to put a giant <laughs> a Fisher plant right in the middle of Waipahu and with the green goo coming out and everything. And and so, I, yeah, I understand that because that's that's where I was, honestly, like a year ago. You know, I was... Well, you've been, you've been, you've been on the <laughs> activist side of things. You're a liberal person. And so you, one would normally say, oh, oh, Corey Chun, he would be against nuclear energy, but not. It's really refreshing. Yeah, yeah. I I've always thought it's it's important to just ha have the have the discussion. You know, I, I when people reach out to me and and share their you know thoughts, I I point out to them that you know I don't consider myself an expert at at anything. I'm, um, you know, so do I consider myself an energy expert? No, or a nuclear energy expert? Oh, definitely not. But I think it's important that we actually hear from those people and have those discussions and conversations, and that's really what my pool was, was all about, and that was the intent of what I was trying to do, is just to say, you know, a lot has, a lot of time has, has passed since that constitutional amendment, which was put into our constitution probably in the 70s. Um, so, 
you know, now maybe is the time we, the technology has got, got to a point where we, we can have these conversations. Well, it's, it's interesting. That was my notion in trying to set up this, um, this show with the, our energy host from Florida, um, who works for uh, an energy efficiency company there. And he's familiar with all the utilities on the East Coast. And um, you know, he believes there's a real future for nuclear energy. Uh, he believes we have all kinds of issues about uh, all our attempts at renewables, um, you know, technological issues and political issues, sociological issues, and so you have to consider it. And in fact, we're going to do a show with him, and I'm sure he's going to he's going to bring up this whole subject. You're not alone, you know. There are other people who have found this technology. But I want to ask you about the commission. Okay, because the commission is really important. On the one hand, you, you hear about mm, commissions that die a slow death on a dusty shelf somewhere, and they never reach any conclusions, and, and the next time you look, they're gone. Um, what makes this commission better? What makes this commission more likely of having a robust conversation? Who would be on this commission? How do you see this commission unfolding? Yeah, so we, we're specifically trying to get folks who have experience, so you know, someone from the University of Hawaii, obviously we'd want, uh, you know, someone local who would provide their take on, you know, the energy landscape, but also, you know, someone from the Department of Energy, because, you know, at the conference, I did get a chance to to hear from the Department of Energy and their, their uh, work to try to figure out a disposal method for nuclear waste, because that's probably the biggest hang up, right? If if the government can figure out a way to do this safely, uh, you know, it will alleviate, alleviate a lot of the, the waste concerns. Uh, but also someone from, the, you know, the the military, just because they have been using nuclear uh, power with their with their submarines and uh, you know other types of vehicles, and then uh, you know just trying to get these people together in a, and and in a room and so oh, some from the Department of Energy, I think I mentioned that. And just to look at, you know, the not just the benefits, but also the drawbacks. Because I, I realize that with anything, right, there's gonna be there's gonna be some trade-offs. And are we willing to uh, you know accept those trade-offs? Uh, that that's really what what the, the point of it was is to just to just have those conversations to see if this is something that you know would would make sense for our our island state. So, so the commission would examine the, the, the pros and the cons. Um, <clears throat> the commission would then what? Uh, and by the way, your, your point about the military is very valuable because, in fact, you know, we, we all assume that nuclear energy has not changed since Three Mile Island, you know, that, that, that meltdown in 1979. But it has. It's changed dramatically, not only in the U.S. for utilities in the U.S., but everywhere in the world. In fact, in the military, they they changed the design of the nuclear reactors uh, on those submarines and on the carriers um, all the time. And they're always improving those things, not only for safety, but for power and for efficiency. Um, you know, it's interesting. You take a, a carrier, for example, the nuclear reactor on a carrier, just like the modular uh, nuclear energy, uh, you, know, you know, that you're talking about, um, it lasts for years and years and years. It probably lasts as long as the useful life of the carrier itself, uh, which means it's really the most important thing about this whole military exercise. And as a result, I suggest to you that a military guy in the commission who is familiar with what they are doing with nuclear energy, I mean, of course, he's not going to tell you anything classified, but... <laughs> But, well, but he could be very, or she could be very valuable in this commission. Yeah, and I forgot to mention, um, there would be a, also a representative from the environmental community because obviously, you know, they're an important part of this discussion. And so we want to be able to, you know, balance that out, right? And to hear from the folks who are, you know, fighting the good fight against climate change and trying to get us to a uh, carbon-free world. Yeah, sure. You have to bring them in on the decision process, or they'll fight with you forever. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, so let's assume that we we've identified here today at least some of the pros and some of the cons. The pros is it lasts for a long time; it's not dangerous anymore. 
Um, and, and actually, I think that, that these modular units, uh, they, they just, you know, you bury it and it's not a problem because when it's, when it's spent, when the uranium is spent, it just stays there. Um, or you can, you know, pull it up and do another one. Um, so then, you know, it's very, that's very efficient, actually. Um, I guess the, the problem is um, it's designed, this modular system is designed ra rather than a big facility. It's a little facility. So it's designed for a small town, a small community. And uh, Hawaii has small towns and small communities, but it also has big towns and big cities like Honolulu. Um, so you you have to sort of adapt, you know, to the size of the community and thus the size of the reactor. Um, but all, all things considered, I think these there's a lot of people who are working on this in the in the U.S. anyway um, to make to make this possible. So I think the technology is very advanced. The efficiency is very advanced. You're right to say that this that there's no greenhouse gases here at all. This is pure green energy, pure. And it is it, it does it does not do damage to the environment. People don't realize that. Um, and, and and finally, um, it's cheap. When when you when you you measure the cost of uh, a, kil a kilowatt hour over the life, the long life of any of these reactor devices, it's way cheaper than anything we're using now. So there are lots of pros. The cons are mostly social. Of course, there's the, there's always the you know the atomic risk, so to speak, yeah. and, and you see like that movie, uh, what was it, what was that movie uh, uh, about the, the guy who uh, invented the nuclear bomb, the atomic bomb recently, and it's scary because they were, they were talking about, you know, destroying the cities and, and hundreds of thousands of people and millions of lives, that's pretty scary. And so what you have is a, a built-in resistance and so a lot of this has to be that this commission has to be able to reach out and explain it and advocate for it and change their minds. That's going to be hard. And um, how do you see that unfolding? Because that's the biggest negative in this whole project. You know, that's a good question. I'm, I'm still trying to figure that out, you know. Um, but yeah, really, it's just about understanding the technology and how do we get there? Um, how do we get that information out so we can just have a very objective uh, conversation about it? And you know, I may be proven wrong. Maybe it's not it's not the right fit for Hawaii. But you know, unless unless we have that conversation and actually have the experts come in and look at it, you know, I, I think it still should be an option that that's on the table. Yeah, I mean, one one thing that comes to mind is the fact that we we stop looking at alternatives. That's my opinion over the past 10 or 15 years uh, for reasons that escaped me. Um, and um, the, you, you're opening a conversation of this particular alternative actually gives way to a larger conversation on alternatives in general. We should be considering them. We should be looking for the best combination uh, of portfolio sources of energy, all of them. And we, we stop doing that. We have to start it up again. And I, you know, a, a viable candidate would be nuclear. I, su I suppose also, you know, you know, Hawaii is a, into a kind of cargo cult. So if we see um, the city of Cincinnati, and I'm just making this up, if we see the Cinci Cincinnati is building a reactor and it's going to be really powerful and cheap and safe, um, and the people have agreed to it, um, then we're going to we're going to take that seriously and say. Hmm, Maybe we should do that too. We don't want to be left behind on this because this could be the next big, you know, non-environmentally damaging possibility. And I think it's not only that, you know, intrinsically the commission, you know, comes up with all the positive points and and argues against the negative points, assuming they make that decision, but also that the commission looks overseas. It looks in Europe. It looks everywhere in Canada, it looks in the U.S., any state, and it finds, gee whiz, you know, there's a lot of Corey Chuns around. <laughs> and that would be a, a powerful message, you know, to our community. And that's got to be part of the, uh, the advocacy, you know? <laughs>
So where does it go from here? What are the prospects of uh, either of these bills getting through? Uh, I mean, realistically, not not very good. Uh, so so my bill to create the Nuclear Energy Commission uh, missed a procedural deadline last week, so it will not get a public hearing. Um, the constitutional amendment is technically still alive, but I haven't heard of a lot of people, you know, interested in, in moving that forward too. So I, I think it's just uh, getting to the point where, you know, even even among my colleagues and even with committee members, just uh, getting that understanding of nuclear energy and just trying to dispel some of the myths, not to promote it above other things because, like I said, you know, there are some trade-offs, right? But but just to have that broader understanding that we're not where we were with nuclear energy back in, in the 70s and uh, the te technology has advanced a lot since then. So what's the connection between the possibility of nuclear energy in Hawaii and the undersea cable? We really, we really dumped on that a few years ago. Um, and, you know, maybe they were going to do a, 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 a wind project in the, in the west end of uh, Lanai, and they were going to, you know, uh, connect all that renewable to other islands, and boy, that got bashed. Um, and uh, as I said, it's radioactive. So the, the question is, um, th does the model that you're thinking of include an undersea cable where you take one place, generate a lot of energy, and transmit it all around the state? Because, you know, we are not a state of separate islands. We are just simply an island state, and we got to get together on that sort of thing. What do you think? You know, I, I recognize that there are a lot of challenges with that, um, especially with, with the costs. But you know, it, it sort of makes sense to just have a statewide grid, sort of like just being connected. Um, you know, I, I do know that there's, you know, when we get to different um, counties and islands, right, and, and Oahu especially because we have the majority of the population, uh, I, I know it could get to, to some folks, it may seem like, you know, all the other states, I mean, I'm sorry, all the other islands are just uh, helping out Oahu, and this is a very Oahu-centric thing. And so I, I don't want it to be about that because I, I do think there are benefits to being able to move power to any island uh, that needs it in you know times of crisis, right? When when for whatever reason you know we need to shift that power around and and to divert power, uh, it, it just kind of would make sense. Not just necessarily about uh, you know one place feeding power to Oahu to make, to meet all of our needs. Um, yeah. And one other element about that, it seems to me, is that a, a state of community with cheap and continuing, you know, uh, energy um, is a state with a better economy. You can do more. You can let the energy work for you. You can let the en energy build your economy. And you know we have we have energy now in the state that costs forty or fifty cents a kilowatt hour still, and, and using and using fuels that are really not good for the cl the climate or the environment. So if if just hypothetically uh, we had cheap energy and plenty of it, um, and all day and all night, you know, not sporadic in any way, seems to me that would help our economy and our future. We need to build the economy. I mean, Maui is a good example uh, of, of, a, of, a, of a problem that needs um, economic incentives and, you know, rebuilding. And so if, if I gave you West Maui and I said, here, you got cheap energy now forever, um, that would help. That would help rebuild Maui, wouldn't it? Possibly. Yeah. I mean, I, <laughs> I haven't really thought about it that way, but, you know, there are... There are opportunities, definitely, uh, if we had a, a, a statewide connected grid. And also yeah. just, you know, we do, yeah, like you mentioned, we do have the highest electricity rates in the, in the country. And so anything we can do when we talk about, you know, just the cost of living, right? We always think about just housing and food, but energy is one of those big issues too. And if we can reduce the costs of, energy for everybody, uh, I think everyone will benefit.
Well, that's true because uh, cheap energy is important to agriculture, and we know we have a problem with agriculture. A farmer who is spending a ton of money on energy can't make any money, and um, you know, and you always hear farmers tell you that if they don't make any money, they're not going to continue to farm. Um, and so, um, energy would help farmers, and thus um, local foods, and thus you know, not so dependent on imported foods, which are way over 90 percent now. This is very dangerous for us. We really have to develop agriculture. And this is one of the ways we could do that. Anyway, so yeah, I think you're going to run into all kinds of problems here with this, these food bills. Um, and it's not likely that you're going to get either one of them going anywhere in this session. But, but um, will you introduce them again? And what, is, what does that depend on, Corey? Um. I don't know. So I, I guess it just depends um, how this conversation goes. You know, I, 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 being new to the legislature, I realize that a lot of the work happens during the interim. So, you know, it, depending on the conversations I have with colleagues, and also, you know, I just talking with folks maybe at a lot Hiko and also the University of Hawaii, and even with some of the environmental groups who, you know, raise concerns about it. Uh, just to just to have those conversations because I think that's really where it has to start, just to get that momentum going. Uh, and I'm slowly learning that that's you know how all kind of legislation works here. It's like you sort of have to do your homework and, and talk to the right people and, and get them on board. So that's sort of the plan. Well, good for you. Be the champion. Associate yourself with the issue. I think that'd be great. And um, if you talk it up, maybe you'll maybe you'll find traction, you know, one day soon. But I want to I want to say that I know you are in, into a lot of other issues, a lot of other bills. Uh, this is particularly interesting for think tech. Uh, we follow energy closely, um, and I'm happy to talk to you about it. But I would also like to circle back and talk with you about some of your other bills and some of your other interests and issues. So I hope we can reschedule. Um, and um, e explore your your other your other bills and your other aspirations. Can we do that? Sure. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> great. Sounds Corey great. Chun, Representative Corey Chun, 35th District, joining us today to talk about a couple of bills that were introduced uh, into the legislature in 2024 about nuclear energy. What an interesting discussion. Thank you so much, Corey. Yeah. Thanks for having me, Jay. Aloha.